tonight on a special edition of Evening. Whoa! We're celebrating our feathered friends. Discover the easy way to recognize birds in the wild. Here, Bubba. Meet the man who cares for the penguins at Woodland Park Zoo. And guess who's the smartest bird in your neighborhood? They're always glad to see me, that's for sure. As Evening goes to the birds. Welcome to the show from Seward Park in Seattle. I'm Saint, and yes, we really are devoting this half hour to the birds. Bird watching spiked in popularity during the pandemic with 60 million Americans taking up the hobby. And studies show every time someone recognizes a bird, like that dark-eyed junco at the feeder, they get a nice shot of endorphins. So the more birds you know, the better you feel. It's also an easy hobby to get into. For me personally, I get a big kick out of sharing birds. My guide is director of the Seward Park Audubon Center, Joey Manson. He knows the exact moment he became a birder. On my way to work one day, driving across Lake Washington on 520, an eagle just drops out of the sky, pulls a fish out, and I've never seen anything like that before. Joey leads people on treks through the park in search of native and migratory birds. How much of birding is audible? I would say a huge portion of it is. As humans, we connect with the sounds of birds first, and they've brought a lot of comfort, says conservationist Joshua Morris. I think that the pandemic forced us into a moment of social isolation and quiet. And during that time, we heard birdsong louder. And I think it got more people interested in the birds that were making those songs. Bird watchers know you can never be in a hurry. So one thing I like to tell people to do is every once in a while just stop and let all of nature get used to you being present. Merlin is a free app that shows you what birds are nearby. Turn on the sound ID and just let it listen for those birds. And if I don't talk too much, it'll probably tell you what kind of birds we're listening to. Connecting with nature is the first step to protecting it. People take care of what they love and they love what they know. We've got a link to that free Merlin app and all kinds of birding info on our website, king5evening.com. Yes, even our website has gone to the birds. While most of us can only expect to see birds from a distance, photojournalist Diane lewis Torrey introduces us to a man who actually knows what it's like to get hugged by a penguin. Each penguin at each meal gets a vitamin. One of our penguins, Pizarin, just has a elevated white blood cell count. All these meds in this single fish. We'll go there. Radar likes herring. It's a lot easier because they just eat the fish and they don't know that there's any meds in them. That's good. All our fish. My name is John Samaris and I'm a lead animal keeper here at Woodland Park Zoo. Come on, back up. For me, it includes the Humboldt penguins. You good boy. Who is ready to eat? Tucker, you're the first one. Ready? Eat it, bud. Gomez, Diamante. It is an amazing experience working with penguins. Good boy. Especially when you have young ones that you rear. Good girl. Gomez, I've been taking care of penguins for 25 years now. And we got radars fish. The first time I met a penguin and started taking care of them, it was just instant love. Oh, Bubba. Where's Benicio? Basically the most important part of my day, come on buddy, is just ensuring the health and well-being of all the animals under my care. Oh, it's off to the next fish. Do you want that buddy? <coughs> ensuring that they're getting the proper diet they need. Here Tucker, they have a rich and stimulating habitat to live in. I like them. Hi buddy. We want a robust and healthy population of animals. Each one is just unique in just its little penguinality. Come on, buddy. I think they're very cute. We have a new heron in the exhibit that visits every day. He just comes to try to steal fish from the penguins and hangs out. 
Hello guys. Solomon. So these are penguins that are incubating eggs. There you go. These are their favorite fish, these little silver sides. They're like little treats for them. So this is a couple. This is Solomon and Fiona. Typically penguins are monogamous and mate for life. Hi. Yeah, there you go. So this is Leona and she laid an egg overnight. They never leave the eggs unattended, so there's always at least one penguin with the eggs. Hey, right, buddy? This guy hatched on March 17th. Hey, little guy. And if you look right here where that little white spot is on the side of his head, that is his ear. And he's just gonna go back in with mom and dad. Humboldt penguins face a lot of problems in the wild. So it's really important for us to have a good breeding program in place and so that we can keep their genetics intact in a captive environment. In the future, we can be sure that on, Bubba. penguins don't disappear from the planet. Hi, Bubba. You fall in love with these guys. Hi, Bubba. What are you doing? Hi. How are you? Are you good boy? You're a good boy. Yes, you are. So they're very special. Good boy, Bubba. You good boy. Bubba sounding a little bit like a donkey there. Yes, Humboldt penguins bray, often to show how happy they are and to attract a mate. Well, joining birders on a hike is an eye-opening way to discover how interconnected we are with nature, as I discovered in the dead of winter at the Skagit River Bald Eagle Interpretive Center. On a wintry weekend morning, the air thick with fog and anticipation. A few dozen hardy souls begin a two-mile hike along the Skagit River, hoping to see bald eagles. They will not be disappointed. There's two bald eagles here uh, across the river. I've got them in the scope. Joe Ordonez has been guiding bald eagle tours here and in Alaska since 1987. For me, the eagle is a charismatic bird. Everybody wants to see it, and then it can be the lead-in to the story of nature and how things sort of fit together. See this kind of peninsula of trees yes. here, right? Yes. And it kind of goes up, and then it comes down. Yeah. If you work your way up that tree, the furthest one out. The farthest the one far on the right. There's the white head there, you can see. We call it the golf ball in the trees. Of course, that only works for adult bald eagles because the adults have the white head. The eagles have come to this river for the winter run of chum salmon. They are really great food resource for these animals when most of their other prey options are not available. As you can see, they're big fish. There's more than 100 different species that rely on salmon for food. But of course, on these walks, it's all about the apex predator sitting high above it all. What's up there? Oh, my God. oh there's a bald eagle. <laughs> I've never been able to really see them up close on drives and stuff, so it's just a fantastic area to visit and learn about the salmon, the eagles, the forest. I'm not complaining, but a lot of these bald eagles were just sort of bundles in a tree, not moving a whole lot. Yeah, that's fair. They're, they're doing a lot of saving energy right now, so because it's winter and there's less food, the more they move, the more uh, their metabolism kind of burns out. So they're kind of spending a lot of time just resting and then finding those fish that are most of the way to dead so that they don't have to do too much work. Along the walk we learn, if we care about eagles, we must care about the salmon and our rivers. We're all more closely connected than it looks. Those tours are offered on the weekends during winter months. Now, you don't have to be eagle-eyed to see one of the most fascinating birds in our area. Since the 1960s, the crow population has increased in Seattle by 9,000%. For their size, crows just might be the brainiest animals on Earth. Social, too. I remember a story I did about a Seattle bus driver, Phyllis Alverdes, who always had a welcoming party when she came to work, because one day she started tossing them peanuts. Professor John Withy is a crow expert, and he says while some crows feast, others act as lookouts. And at dusk, they fly by the thousands to roost together for safety. And when they sleep, maybe they dream about the lady tossing them peanuts. It's one of the surest signs of spring, great blue herons making nests in trees high above Magnolia's Commodore Park. 
the official city bird of Seattle, by the way. Welcome back to our show. Now let's meet a young man who holds the record for the most bird species spotted in Washington State in a single year. I love Titlow just because there's such a nice diversity of habitat in such a small area. When Will Brooks goes birding. These are mugles. Just the way they're lined up on the log is hilarious. <laughs> He's not just trying to collect. Those are double-crested cormorants. A wide assortment of bird sightings. Out in the back, there's some pigeon guillemots. He's after the kind of rush that comes with spotting something rare. It's usually really intense focus. I'm often really completely zeroed in on the birds, so it's uh, it can be intense. <laughs> It's funny how you can't go to a birding spot in Tacoma without seeing one of the same, like, five people, maybe. <laughs> Among Tacoma birders. Ah, hooded merganser. This recent University of Puget Sound grad is considered a sort of savant. So there's a Cooper's hawk up there, and then you can hear there's a lot of other birds calling in here that are all sort of riled up about the Coopers. UPS professor Peter Wimberger is a fellow birder. To be able to see birds and to distinguish different species, you got to have really sharp eyes and really good ears. And Will has both of those. Pretty close to 50-50 Brant's cormorants and pelagic cormorants. When we first started dating, he would try to point out birds to me, and I just could not figure out how he saw them from so far away or where they were. When a job fell through in 2021, Will decided to pursue what birders call a big year. Yeah, it's sort of collecting. You're trying to see as many species as you can. Will's big year was very big. He broke the 10-year-old record for most bird sightings in the state by six. It was 376 species, and yeah, those were distributed all over. He spotted a pileated woodpecker in Tacoma, a broad-winged hawk in Walla Walla, a leased sandpiper in Skagit County, and in Ording, Will was the first birder to ever spot a winter wren in Washington. Oh, it's a total rush. If you decide that you're going to go for a record like that, it ends up becoming a job. It takes some serious commitment. To the day I broke the record, I actually started out birding in Tacoma, going after a thick-billed myrrh that a friend of mine found. And then within the same day, I drove three hours down to Skamania County to chase a Blackburnian warbler that was found the day before, and then headed back. It's unusual. Unusual, maybe, but definitely impressive. And it's a skill I didn't know existed, but I appreciate that it's in my life now. Will is working on a PhD now. He does field research in Borneo and tells me he has seen more birds than ever. The Northwest is a birder's paradise because of the diversity of our habitat, and birds have become a favorite subject for a young photographer I met in Long Beach. Nature photographer Jay Stenerson opened his gallery at age 19, and he says he lives in a great place to photograph birds. Long Beach Peninsula has over 300 species. There's so many different kinds of hawks, shorebirds, songbirds. To get his best-selling photograph of these three owlets, Jace climbed 60 feet up into a tree and snapped his fingers to get them looking. You'll find Jace Walker Photography on Pacific Avenue in Long Beach. 75 miles up the coast from Long Beach in Hoquiam, birders gather in early May to see the migration of shorebirds from Argentina to Alaska. It's a great place and time to do some bird watching and some people watching. This is Grace Harbor National Wildlife Refuge. It's also known as Bowerman Basin. I don't think I've ever seen so many in one place. I've learned to look through my telescope and kind of get a sense of what a hundred birds are, and then I give a click. A lot of these are Dunlin and Western Sandpipers that have just migrated in from the south. They are frantically eating. They're probing the mud flap and looking for food. It's pretty cool because they're flying everywhere. They're moving north into toward Alaska to breed. 
But they can't make it all in one fell swoop, and so they have these critical areas that they stop and forage and rest. They pack into this huge estuary by the thousands. Give her a chance to see. Look up. Oh my gosh, guys. Look at that. Woohoo! Does anyone remember what that's called when they fly like that? Mur. Murmuration. Oh, nice eye. Do you guys see the ones flying right there? Look up. Oh my gosh. They're going right above. Oh, this is very cool. Okay, we got a falcon up in the air there. They have a heck of a journey ahead of them. They have a lot of perils. Now, there's a lot of threats and, and habitat loss all along the coast. Thankfully, this area is available to them to stop over and eat. All right, now that you're getting a sense of just how fun it is to see birds, guess what? You don't have to go to Hoquiam. You can get birds to come to you. Here's how. Take a pine cone, generously spread some peanut butter on it, dip it in bird seed, and hang it high and out of reach of squirrels and cats. You just saved yourself 80 bucks on a bird feeder. Every winter, a blizzard of snow geese make the Skagit Valley home in numbers as high as 50,000. Most of them Russian born, they head back north in the springtime. That, by the way, is what you call a group of snow geese, a blizzard. Welcome back to the show. In Lewis County, I found a story about love, harmony, and six foot tall flightless birds, all on an emu ranch. We are an e-harmony couple. <laughs> Tony was a real estate agent outside Portland. Janine, the city attorney for University Place. They met halfway, which explains the location of Three Feathers Ranch, but not what they've been raising since 2009. <laughs> I blame him. I tell everybody I didn't know what an emu was when I met him. Since the late 80s, emus have been farmed for meat and for their fat, which gets rendered into oil used in soaps, serums, and salves. It's good for burns, cuts, scars, wrinkles. And it will make you look 10 years younger. It's the best stuff. With the help of Janine's daughter, Emily, the couple raise the birds from the moment the eggs are laid. These are just days from hatching. And already, the chicks inside are responding to taps and whistles. These are a couple of months old. In the wild, emus don't travel in flocks, which may be why they seem to be tripping over each other. They are extremely strong and agile at this age. Older birds appreciate the attention they get from people. Well, they're curious and shy, they're not aggressive, and they're really playful. They can also make what sounds like a drumming sound. They have a throat sack that they bring air into, and that's just the females, and they expel it in a staccato way. Tony and Janine have learned a lot from their emus, but the main lesson is, when it comes to love, don't be afraid to stick your neck out. <laughs> If you're interested in some of those emu oil products, we have a link on our website. A visit to a tropical rainforest in the heart of Seattle when we return. Welcome back to our show from Seward Park. We're gonna leave you tonight with a visit to Woodland Park Zoo's rainforest. Have a great evening and remember, the more birds you see, the happier you feel. There's a bird up in the tree here, honey. What a bird. Hello, bird. It's fun to listen to them. They talk to each other, do they? Oh, here's a big bird. The longer we sit here, we hear new sounds. Repertoire. He's got a kind of a rattle. Yeah. Oh, yeah, isn't he pretty? Golden yellow grosbeak. Oh, there he goes. 